Hello, welcome to Children's Time. This week you are gonna need a candle and your best singing voices. We are gonna be singing happy birthday to the church and blowing out our candles. So um, grab a candle and I will see you guys soon. The Lord be with you. Greetings and welcome on this Pentecost Sunday from my home to yours. We gather together and for those of us in the Ottawa area, we do so on the traditional and unceded lands of the Algonquin people. As we gather together here this morning, our scripture brings us to the apostles gathered together in Jerusalem and praying. Let's listen now for the voice of the one who has called us here today. And as we do, let us keep watch together for the flame and the spirit that will not go out. From Acts chapter two. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound from this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, proselytes Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? As we reflect on these words, let's begin our worship together in prayer. Lord of life, Spirit of wind and flame, Prince of Peace. How great is your love, how deep. We have come this way, God, this day, God, that we might learn to walk in your ways, following Jesus, doing mercy and justice, loving kindness, proclaiming your kingdom as we go. And as we come seeking to do this, we ask, O oh God, that you would have mercy upon us. For we know we've been here before. We've come to this day. We've spoken about the depth of your love. We've proclaimed the greatness of your name. We've promised to love and be faithful in our turn. And yet too often, we have found ourselves attached to our own comforts and corners so that we have ended up living in the service, not of you or our neighbor, but of ourselves and our own desires. We confess that in the way we have lived in this world and related to our neighbors, we have sinned against you and departed from your ways. And so do have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Do not look on our sins, do not turn from us, but forgive us. Work in our hearts and create in us a new spirit. Teach us wisdom this day. Restore us to the joy and gladness that comes with your presence. Pour out your spirit upon us once more. Sustain in us a willingness to walk in your ways and push us out into your world. As we come together in prayer now in the name of Jesus, we pray together the prayer he teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, 
this is God's answer to our prayers. That there is nothing in this world or the world to come, nothing you nor I can say or do, leave undone or left unsaid, that can separate us from that love that seeks us out and would welcome us home. All this, that we in our turn might share this love we know in Christ with others. In his name. Amen. Happy birthday to the church. Happy birthday to the church. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to the church. Yeah, so we are singing happy birthday and blowing out the candle as we sing happy birthday to the church. So um, this is signifying the Holy Spirit. So like the candle, like that light that's deep inside of each of us as Christians, um, it's Jesus, right? That flame, that light in us. And when we see the smoke, it reminds us of the Holy Spirit that is all around us. And that's what we are talking about today. The birthday of the church. So Pentecost is this Sunday, so today, and we are celebrating. So um, it's like a big birthday party, lots of fun. There's candles, um, some churches celebrate with cake. Um, and so I have some ideas of what you guys can do to celebrate Pentecost this weekend. But before we do that, I wanna tell you guys the story about Pe Pentecost. So after Jesus went back up to heaven, which we talked about last week, ascension, that word going up, um, he said he was going to send a friend to be with us forever. And that friend is the Holy Spirit. So um, his disciples were all gathered in one place together. And it was like this big wind came rushing in. And all of a sudden, it was like they had flames dancing on their heads, above their heads. And it was the Holy Spirit. And 
They were suddenly able to speak in many different languages so that they could share about Jesus with everyone all over the world. And um, yeah, the Holy Spirit gave them that power. And Jesus gave that to them as a friend to be with them always. And so it's super exciting, super special that we have the Holy Spirit as our friend with us who helps us make good and good decisions, helps us, it's our conscious, right? It's that sense of I should or shouldn't do this and it helps us make good choices. And so I'm gonna show you guys a really cool picture of what an artist thought it looked like on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. And it kind of looks like a dove above the followers of Jesus. And a lot of people think that um, the Holy Spirit looks like a dove. They, that's what it symbolizes, the dove. So I am going to give you guys some ideas of what you could do to celebrate Pentecost this weekend. So um, you could fly a kite in the wind. You could learn to say, I love you in a new language, because like we just heard in our story, the Holy Spirit helped all the disciples be able to speak all these different languages so they could share the word of God. You could wear red. I don't have any, a lot of red, so I'm wearing some red lipstick. Um, you could make a cake and say happy birthday to the church that way. And um, last one, you could make an origami dove. So origami is like when you are folding all the paper together. You could draw a dove. You could do lots of different things, but those are just some ideas. And so if we were together, we would be celebrating uh, the church and we would be celebrating the Holy Spirit. And so I hope that you find ways to celebrate this weekend. Um, another thing you could do is a lot of people think of fire. So if you live in an area where you can have a bonfire, you could have a bonfire. Or if you don't, you can make s'mores. That's something that we did at Kids Church last weekend. We made s'mores to celebrate Pentecost. Um, and so we are going to do um, our prayer now. Um, and so we're going to do it a little bit different this week. So I want you guys to take a deep breath in with me and we're gonna say one word as we breathe out as our prayer. So our first word you can repeat after me, I'm gonna take a deep breath in and say, peace. I'm gonna take another deep breath in. Hope. Love. Holy Spirit. Amen. So we just did that funny little breathe prayer to help us to remember that the Holy Spirit is like a breath, right? It's like the wind around us. It fills up our lungs. And as we breathe in and out, we can share Jesus with the other people around the world in the kind way that we live our life. So I hope that you guys have a great Pentecost and I wish that we could celebrate it together. But if you join us for Sunday school, um, we will be making Pentecost headbands. So I hope to see you there. A few announcements as we continue our worship together this Pentecost Sunday. Quickly just want to remind you that if you have someone in your household who is graduating this year, whether it's kindergarten, elementary school, high school, college, university, another program, please let us know. We'd like to be able to share that celebration with them. So yeah, contact the church office, contact Sydney, please do that. But, but most of all in this time, I want to, um, to thank Dorian Jensen for joining us for worship this morning. You'll have already heard from him in our first hymn this morning, and he's going to introduce himself to you now.
Hi, my name is Dorian Jensen. Uh, I am a Two-Spirit Métis person from Manitoba originally. Um, I've been singing for just over half my life, and I'm really pleased to be singing for you today. Um, for this reconciliation-themed service, I selected three hymns that I thought spoke to spoke to the themes and ideas of reconciliation. One of them is Many and Great, O God, Are Thy Works by Dakota composer Joseph Renville. It was written in the first half of the 19th century. Um, Renville was born to a French Catholic father and a Dakota mother. Um, he eventually grew up, married a Dakota woman, and converted to Protestantism, at which point he began composing hymns himself. Uh, Many and Great, O God, Are Thy Works is a Christian hymn, but it makes use of some traditional Dakota melodic motifs and some of the lyrics gesture at ideas that and stories that he would have been taught by his mother or possibly by his wife. Um, he wrote about 50 hymns in his life overall, many of which were published later in hymnals for both indigenous and non-indigenous churches. The second hymn I've chose, chosen is This Path We Walk, which has lyrics by S. Curtis Tufts and is to the tune of O Wally Wally. Um, Tufts is a United Church minister from Canada who wrote this piece as to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the United Church's apology for residential schools. Um, the lyrics obviously engage with that reality and with the church's cruelty to indigenous communities by talking about how to come together and heal in the wake of something that that did such harm and find a a new collective path forward. Um, it's it's a really moving lyric, and uh, I'm very glad that Tufts gave us gave me permission to sing it for you here today. Those two pieces were written specifically by Indigenous composers or on Indigenous themes. The third piece I chose is a 19th century French Catholic hymn from a book called Trois Saintes Cantiques. Uh, I chose this piece because as a Métis person from the prairie, my ancestors would have been French Catholic, and I wanted to do something to honor my specific ancestry rather than indigenous people more generally. Métis people on the prairie would have sung songs like this in church themselves, and I wanted to call back to, to what the people in my family would have known. Um, I looked through that book, and I chose Douce Lumière because it is a hymn about the Holy Spirit and a hymn about bringing peace and rejuvenating a world that has has been harmed. Um, and I think that's something we need to do. We need to look at the harm we've done to the earth and find a, a new way forward to bring life back to it. Um, so it is a piece that felt appropriate for, for a day like today. Thank you very much. I'm reading from Ezekiel 37, verse 1 to 13, the valley of dry bones. Please pray with me before we read. Merci, Seigneur, pour l'opportunité que tu me donnes de lire ta parole. Merci pour le Saint-Esprit que nous avons en nous. Merci, Seigneur de nous donner l'opportunité de comprendre ta parole et le courage de la mettre en pratique. Au nom de Jésus-Christ, nous te prions. Amen. The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley and they were very, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, 
can these bones live? I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophecy to, do, to these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, that says the Lord God, come from the four winds, whole breath, and breathe upon this land that they may live. I prophesied, and he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your grace and bring you up from your grace, oh my people and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your grace and bring you up from your grace. Oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of God. Amen. Many and great, O God, are thy things, maker of earth and sky. Thy hands have set the heavens with stars, thy fingers spread the mountains and plains. Lo, as at thy word the waters were formed, deep seas obey thy voice. Grant unto us communion with thee, 
thou star abiding one. Come unto us and dwell with us. With thee are found the gifts of life. Bless us with life that has no end, eternal life with Two years ago, nine of us from St. Andrews participated in the Presbyterian Church in Canada's Healing and Reconciliation Study Tour, continuing the journey it was called. Among the many places we visited on that trip was the second site of the Cecilia Jeffries Indian Residential School. This is one of 11 schools that the Presbyterian Church in Canada was part of, took part in running during the, that era in our nation's history. The Cecilia Jeffrey site, the second site when we visited it, is near Kenora, Ontario. That's Treaty 3 land and the traditional home of the Ojibwe and the Chippewa. Some of you might know something of Cecilia Jeffrey's residential school if you have heard of Cheney Wenjack. He was a young Indigenous boy, about 12 years old, who died in October 1966 walking the railroad tracks trying to escape from the Cecilia Jeffrey's school. His home was 400 miles away. He didn't know that. He didn't know where it was or how to find it, but like so many children, more than we'll ever be able to imagine, he did try. Gordon Downey of The Tragically Hip has made Cheney's story personal for us in recent years. He wrote a song, The Secret Path, and a graphic novel about Cheney. And in an article about the, the song and the novel and his own and, and what it means to him, he writes, I never knew Cheney, the child that is teacher's misnamed Charlie, but I will always love him. Downey, about his writing and his song, says, I did this because I was trying in a small way to help what Murray Sinclair said. This is not an Aboriginal problem. This is a Canadian problem. Because at the same time, that Aboriginal people were being demeaned in the schools and their culture and language were being taken away from them. And when they were being told that they were inferior, they were pagans, that they were heathens and savages and that they were unworthy of being respected. That very same message was being given to the non-Aboriginal children in the public schools as well. They need to know that history includes them. Gordon Downey, before he died, made Cheney's story very personal for many of us, particularly those who had participated in or followed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's particularly personal for me because as I read Cheney's story, I can never get out of my mind that the night he died was the night I was born. I think of the long years and the good life I have lived and I am speechless at what was taken. There were many poignant moments on the trip out west but today I remember with you the day we traveled to the Cecilia Jeffrey site. Looking out the window of our bus, it was all rocks and trees, rough and rugged northern Ontario, beautiful in its own way. But just imagine, my seatmate said, imagine the children who tried to run away through this. You can't see very far, the ground is so uneven, no wonder they followed the railway tracks. We arrived at the site. What what What's, what's there now is a memorial. We, were, we arrived there, we were greeted by elders and residential school survivors. There was a ceremony, a circle around the memorial. Tobacco was offered, smudging. Survivors of the school shared their stories. Time passed slowly and quickly all at once as those sharing their stories took all the time they needed to speak. When we rose from the circle, hours had passed. Lunch came with an opportunity to reflect quietly and converse. And then we were shown around the site. 
Little is left of the school. Just a small piece of the foundation. It was torn down. There's a few steps, but from where it stood, we could see the, the woods and the trees rising up be from behind, and then a low green hill extending down to the lake. A deceivingly tranquil scene, as we are reminded that many children were buried there and their graves remain unmarked. He remembered that grassy hill in 2019, September 30th, when I was one of those from the Presbyterian Church in Canada who attended the ceremony with residential school survivors and families and all who walk a path of, of reconciliation at the Canadian Museum of History as the, it was the, that day that the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation released the first list of the known names of children who died and went missing at residential schools. And it's not a complete list. But as our own moderator of the PCC wrote at the time, one cannot express the depth of sorrow that losing a child causes a family. Even speaking of healing in this context is painful. For how can one heal from such loss? For some survivors, families, and communities, the release of these names will perhaps be a step towards closure. Yet some may also struggle with reopened wounds. Many still seek answers about what happened to their loved ones. There are more names yet to be found and much work lies ahead to gather the names and stories of those lost children and to honor their lives. For all those who mourn the children named and those who have yet to be named, we share the mourning. Our moderator wrote that. And I remember, again, for you, the words of Murray Sinclair. This is not an Aboriginal problem. It is a Canadian problem. Friends, as Christians, we come to the scriptures today. And I would say this to you. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. When I repeat the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Very often when we say these words and speak them, we think of them as individuals, as a gift to individuals and the eternal life that greets us after this life. But as we come to Healing and Reconciliation Sunday on this day of Pentecost this year, almost 55 years since Cheney Wenjack died, the story of Ezekiel's vision of the resurrection of the dry bones reminds us that in the power of the Spirit, God also makes possible the resurrection of a whole people, a community that was dead and dried out. God's life and word is offered to them as hope for the future. Ezekiel's own story began in Jerusalem. He was the son of a priest and a priest himself. This was the tradition, this was the future that lay out before him until the Babylonian defeat of the city and the destruction of the temple where he served. Like many, Ezekiel was carried into exile, into a strange land, where together with his people, he experienced a profound crisis that was social, political, and spiritual. In Babylon, there was a constant threat of assimilation by another culture. Without a temple, how were they to keep the faith? Where was God? Ezekiel, the priest, finds himself caught up in a new spirit and becomes Ezekiel, the prophet. And if the words in the earlier part of his book, before the exile, are words of warning to the people, the words he offers now at this point in chapter 37, coming in the midst of political and religious tragedy, raises up the promise of a resurrection of the whole community life that lies ahead to a people who felt dried out and dead with no hope lost separated from their home their the bedrock of their community taken from them it was like they had no flesh no muscles no sinews how were they how were they to move what could they they do they had come apart they were like dried out bones picked over and fallen apart after a battle no ability to move, to come together. And the word that God gives Ezekiel is a word of hope that, that knits them together, that puts flesh back on them, muscles, sinews, so that they, 
they take form again, that they become a people again, and then a spirit is given to them, and not just any spirit, but God's own spirit. The spirit of God that breathed life into humanity in the very beginning is breathed into these people, and the community is lifted up and offered a future. There was hope in this vision for the people in exile. Hope that gave meaning to those who were lost spiritually. God had not forgotten them. God was with them. Hope that spurred them on in the time of exile as the people continued to, to seek ways to be faithful to God without the institution of the, the temple and the structures they'd had in Jerusalem, they began to find new ways to keep God at the center of what they were doing. Practices like Sabbath, the Passover, their diet. In these, they found ways of protecting and transmitting the things that they valued as a people and their identity as God's own. All this they could keep until the day of restoration when they are returned to the land. Do you hear echoes of our own country's history in this story from Ezekiel? The hope of the resurrection of a whole people, the restoration of a community. There's hope there. Friends, assimilation was the primary reason behind the establishment of the Indian residential schools. They were not voluntary. The historical evidence is that the indigenous nations preferred the day school system on their reserves. As a result of an amendment to the Indian Act in 1920, it became law for First Nations children to attend residential schools. It wasn't voluntary. They had to go. Families were torn apart. Communities were destroyed. As early as 1907, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, chief medical officer for the federal government and a member of St. Andrews, Ottawa, released a report highlighting the incredibly high death rates, often due to tuberculosis and poor health conditions in the residential schools. This report was released to members of parliament in November of 1907, and a report on it appeared in the Evening Citizen, which is now called the Ottawa Citizen. Dr. Bryce's report was not well received and he was fired. Decades passed. Generations. Since the mid-1980s, there's been a growing recognition and awakening in the Presbyterian Church in Canada of its part in the painful legacy of the Indian residential schools. In 1994, as a denomination, we adopted a confession that we formally presented at the Forks National Site in Winnipeg. Phil Fontaine, Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, received it on behalf of the First Nations people. A copy of it is on our website. In 2007, the Indian School Settlement Agreement came into effect, and the Presbyterian Church in Canada is part of that, along with other churches that ran the residential schools, the Government of Canada, and other Indigenous organizations, along with representatives of survivors of the schools and former students. This agreement, among other things, included compensation for those who attended the residential school and led to the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which listened to and gathered stories of hundreds of survivors across this country. On our trip out west two years ago, we visited the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, where these stories now reside. And in the many places we visited, we also heard the stories of many survivors themselves. It is hard to listen to painful experiences. It is hard to hear that an organization or a community that we are part of has historically inflicted hurt on others. Reconciliation I am learning is about sitting and listening to other people's truths and not jumping to be defensive first to receiving and listening. Reverend Dr. Margaret Mullen, who is a minister at Place of Hope Presbyterian Church in Winnipeg said this to us, that in hearing the stories we hear from survivors, it is not her desire that we feel guilt, 
but that instead we feel a godly sorrow and do something about it. I'll say that again. Reverend Dr. Margaret Mullen, who is herself a minister, Indigenous and an Indigenous ministry of the church, says it is not her desire that we feel guilt, but that instead we feel a godly sorrow and do something about it. For me, her words are like those of the prophet Ezekiel, breathing hope into us, offering us the spiritual certainty that there is a way forward, that we journey together in God's presence. There is a breath and word of God in in that. Feel a godly sorrow and do something about it. I can breathe in and breathe out and sit and listen. Her words came back to me again when the results of the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry came out very recently now. That inquiry heard from 700 survivors, friends and family members. In the words of the executive summary of the inquiry's report, Colonial violence, as well as racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people has become embedded in everyday life. Whether this is through interpersonal forms of violence, through institutions like the healthcare system and the justice system, or in the laws, policies, and structures of Canadian society. The result has been that many Indigenous people have grown up normalized to violence, while Canadian society shows an appalling apathy to addressing the issue. Mahatma Gandhi once said that what offends him more than those who do evil is the indifference of righteous people. Friends, let us not be apathetic. Let us remember what Murray Sinclair says, that this is not an Aboriginal problem, it is a Canadian problem. Let us hear and remember the words of one of the witnesses quoted in the Murder and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls report, and there are many people quoted. But this one, listen, believe me, pray for me, don't forget me. And again, from Margaret Mullen in Winnipeg, let us feel a godly sorrow and do something about it. I can hear you. What do we do, you ask? Where do we begin? Rai Moran is the founding director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. It houses the permanent collection of statements and documents and other materials gathered on residential schools and continues the work of making sure that reconciliation happens in Canada and ensuring that as many Canadians as possible take part in the reconciliation movement. Several years ago on CBC, Rai Moran spoke about how many of the calls to action outlined in the TRC are certainly the responsibility of the Canadian government. But he reminds us that there are also very many smaller actions that average Canadians can act on. One of the fundamental responsibilities that individuals have is to take that inner journey, that self-reflected journey, reflective journey, and ask themselves, what really am I carrying around? What prejudices, what biases? Perhaps what racism am I carrying around? And he offers these five questions. Do I know any Indigenous people? If not, why? Have I ever participated in a ceremony? If not, why? Am I able to name the traditional territory I stand on? If not, why? Have I meaningfully engaged in deep conversation with Indigenous people? If not, why? Have I read an Indigenous author? If not, why? These are important questions that we can begin to ask ourselves as we actively begin the work of addressing these concerns. The TRC, Rai Moran, said, has lit a flame in this country, the TRC being the truth and reconciliation question. And the question for all of us now is what do we do to bring, what do we bring to the fire? He points out that the symbol of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is, is a flame. The symbols on the door, you should see it on the 
and the image on your screen. His question is, what do each of us bring to that fire that it might be as bright and strong and resilient as enduring as possible? Now that is a Pentecostal question, isn't it? And as the spirit moves among us, bringing breath, bringing us together as community, I want we get to hear now the encouragement that comes from Stacy Huber, who was part of the trip out west two years ago. She had told me what she's been doing recently. It was an encouragement to me, and she's going to share with you now how the journey continues for her. Good morning, my name is Stacy Huber. I've been a member of St. Andrews since 2008. Today I'm going to be talking to you about um, three books by Indigenous authors. I became uh, interested in Indigenous authors uh, after I attended the 2019 Truth and Reconciliation uh, tour that we went on. It was a PCC tour that went through Northern Ontario, uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. It was an amazing trip. But changed my life and I became really interested in um, Indigenous authors. I started reading a bunch of books, so I'm going to review a few of them with you today. The first book I'll be talking about is called River Woman. It's by Katrina Vermette. Katrina Vermette is uh, Metis. She's Metis. She's from uh, Winnipeg, from the north end of Winnipeg. We visited the north end of Winnipeg on a Truth and Reconciliation trip, so I, I know a lot about the neighborhood she's talking about. Why is it called River Woman? Well, uh, the river in here it would be the Red River that runs through Winnipeg. Uh, runs through Winnipeg. It's the heart of Winnipeg, really. And there's a the book consists of about uh, 35 poems or so, and they cover a range of topics from spiritual connections, the colonial legacy, uh, connections of nature. There's even a poem about ghosts, which is very interesting. It's a very moving very moving there's lots of very moving poems it's really interesting and just a very um some of the subject matter is quite quite serious but, but it's uh when you read the poems you'll you'll feel very calm it's a very relaxing relaxing read um it helps it encouraged me to do a lot of meditation upon reading these poems it's a very interesting book i was actually lucky to meet uh, Ms. Uh, Vermette. Uh, at the Ottawa Writers Festival in 2019. And I'll show you here, she actually uh, signed the book for me. So it was very special to meet her. If you if you read this book and you end up liking it, uh, she has another novel called The Break. That's about the north end of Winnipeg. That's very interesting. So the second book I'm gonna cover here is called um, In My Own Moccasins by Helen Knott. And Helen Knott is Dane Zan Nihia, and she's also mixed European descent. She's from Fort St. John, BC, so the other end of the country. And this is her autobiography, it's a memoir. And it details her life, her struggles, um, her experiences with, um, with uh, abuse, sexual violence, um, living a very transient lifestyle, addiction. But the the what's really um, what makes it a really fascinating book is that you start off, she starts off in a very dark place and then she moves gradually on a path of healing and, and a path of healing and love. And the book has a, has a happy ending. It's a really fascinating book. Um, what I noticed about this memoir is even though a lot of the subject matter is quite dark, um, Ms. Knott, she never victimizes herself. She just tells her story in a very frank, a very direct, unapologetic, doesn't victimize herself. And it doesn't place a lot of blame on other people, but uh, it just shows her experience as an Indigenous woman, her her story. It's fascinating. And I was lucky to meet Ms. Knott as well at the uh, Ottawa Writers Festival. And you can see, this is really special. It's written in her own uh, language, so it's a very special inscription. I'll always treasure this. It's very nice. The third book, you've probably heard of this one. It's was on the CBC Canada Reads list. Um, it's won some awards. It's called From the Ashes it's by Jesse Thistle. This is also a memoir, and um, Mr. Thistle is uh, Metis Cree. Cree, Metis Cree. He is from 
um, originally from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and it tells its entire story from, from being a little child to growing up. And it's a memoir that covers similar subject matter to Ms. Knott's. He experienced abuse as a child, addiction, um, but he was um, homeless on the streets for several periods in this book. He had a very, very difficult life, but similar to the other book, um, this, this um, memoir has a very, very happy ending. He eventually, uh, uh, he uh, eventually ended up doing a university degree, and now he's an assistant professor of Métis studies at York University. So it has a very happy ending. Normally, I wouldn't tell you spoil the ending of a book, but I want you to know that that there is a very happy ending. And it's a very uh, what I found really uh, especially moving about the book is that uh, in the latter part of the book, uh, Mr. Thistle. He was, he was um, involved in petty crime and he ended up staying at Harvest House, which is a rehabilitation center in Ottawa. And I know all about Harvest House because I work at the courthouse and we send a lot of clients to Harvest House. So, um, And I checked the dates, like when he would have been at Harvest House, because in the book he goes, he tells you what the years are of everything. But he would um, he would have long ended his, his uh, petty crime. By the time I arrived at the courthouse, he was doing really well. He would have been in university, so I never, never came across his cases at court. But really, really interesting, and um, it was a great privilege to meet Mr. Thistle. I met him actually in February 2020, just before the start of the pandemic. I got to meet him. Fascinating, fascinating person, and uh, he signed the book for me. Very special inscription. A really, really fascinating story, and um, just very inspiring. Very, very inspiring that book. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed my little book review here. It's the first time I've done a book review. I hope you enjoyed it. And when the pandemic is over and we can actually meet in person, I'll be very pleased to loan any of these books to you. Thank you. This path we walk through joy and tears, the living way of faith and fears, through each step's risk, each sorrow's pain, when walked in love we'll rise again. Is shed together free. We'll grow to be all we can be. A circle white will call us home when wrapped in love. We're not alone. These gifts we bring, this light we hold. Songs of grace, our stories told, remain undone, told just in part, till shared in love and known by heart. When life is shared together bound, God's richest gifts together walk the Spirit's way, when love's the guide we shall not stray. This life we share, a blessing deep, a promised gift now ours to keep. God grant our words were spoken true. Now clothed in life each day anew. Let us pray. 
Creator God, help us to come today in the spirit of humility as we pray for healing and reconciliation between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada and the world. Help us to listen and break open our hearts in love that we might receive and care for each other well. We pray for the healing of the generations, for children, for their parents and elders, for their families and communities. We pray that they might thrive body, mind and soul, that they might delight in their culture and identity and be safe and secure in this world. We pray, O oh God, for the murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people. We pray for those who are missing and for those who love them, for all who seek answers and justice, and for all who are still waiting and needing to feel safe. We give you thanks for the many ways you reveal yourself, Creator God, in the lives of Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. We pray for Indigenous elders and those who keep the teachings of their people and for all who work for the wholeness and health of their communities. We pray for the members of the National Indigenous Ministries Council, the Indigenous Indigenous Ministries of the Presbyterian Church in Canada and their leaders. For the Winnipeg Inner City Mission, Place of Hope Indigenous Presbyterian Church, Winnipeg, Flora House, Winnipeg, the Anami Wigamig Fellowship Center in Kenora, the Mistawasis Memorial Presbyterian Church in Saskatchewan. Saskatoon Native Circle Ministries, Edmonton Urban Native Ministries, Nazco and Arian Dakel Outreach, Caribou Region in British Columbia, Hummingbird Ministries in Vancouver, Cedar Tree Ministries on Vancouver Island. We pray for our country and for our church, our own communities and the places we live. Help us to grow in new understandings of our past, not that we might be superior to those who have gone before us, but that we might be led in ways that value life and healing and wholeness. May we be led by the experiences and insights of Indigenous people. Keep us determined to see the ways racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia have become embedded in everyday life and institutions, policies and practices that accord privilege to some and not to others. Keep us compelled that we confront oppression and advocate for the right to culture, health, security, and justice for all your people. Keep us in hope. As we come through this pandemic, we pray for all God's children and all the visions that opens us up to new ways of living in this world together. In the name of Jesus, who teaches us to love. Amen. Amen. What does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our Lord? As you go now, that you may do all this, may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, wind, breath, fire be with you, now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.